In episode 137 of the Guitar Music Theory podcast, I teach you a minor seven chord hack, plus answer listener questions about looper pedals, exercises, stage fright, ADHD, and more. Greetings, guitar engineers. Welcome to the Guitar Music Theory Podcast. I am your host, Desi Serna. And today, I'm going to teach you a minor seven chord hack where you take familiar major chords and use them to play minor seven chord inversions. This is a great hack because you can move around the fretboard playing minor seven chords without needing to learn any new shapes. I've also posted a video on my YouTube channel and Facebook profile, as well as Instagram and TikTok, so be sure to search for Desi Cerna Guitar on those platforms, plus the words Minor 7 Chord Hack to see the complete presentation, which includes some fretboard diagrams. Here in the podcast, I'm also going to answer some listener questions. I've got some questions about using looper pedals, uh, exercises, dealing with stage fright, a question about ADHD, and more. It's going to be a great discussion as always, but before we get started, what do you specifically need to do in order to become a better guitar player? Well, head to my website, guitarmusictheory.com, answer the question I ask you about your playing, and I'll send you free custom video instruction that is calibrated to your current level. Whether you're a beginner still needing to learn the basics, or you need help with playing bar chords, finger picking, guitar soloing, or you want to delve deeply into music theory, I have a free video course for you. I'll help you fill gaps in your knowledge and fill gaps in your playing so that you have more fun on your instrument, you sound better, you move forward, and you reach your music goals. So enroll in your free video course now at guitarmusictheory.com. You can click on the link in the podcast show notes. All right, so we are ready to dive in with my minor seven chord hack. And um, I'm going to play a portion of The Doors Light My Fire to demonstrate how to apply this concept. And let me just jump right into that, playing a couple of uh, minor arpeggios here that I've put into my looper pedal. Um, This is uh, similar to what you hear in the solo section to Light My Fire. And let me play some minor seven chord inversions over this. Sounds like this. All right, so there's a little sample of what we're going to get to here. So let's kind of back up and talk about this and why it is so useful. Uh, First of all, I am playing my PRS McCarty 594. I was on the neck pickup there, and I have Seymour Duncan 59 pickups in here. Playing through my Kemper profiling amplifier using my profile of a vintage 1968 Super Lead from Top Jimmy. And I just have some... uh, What do I have on here? Just some reverb and like a really slight slap back delay and some compression just to um, give it more of kind of an amp in the room sort of sound here. All right, so um, I've got a video on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, and that would probably be the best way to learn this uh, concept. I've got some neck diagrams in there, and you can see me uh, play everything. So just go to any of those platforms and search Desi Cerna Guitar. Be sure to uh, follow my profile, uh, or more specifically, just search Desi Cerna Guitar um, Minor 7 Chord Hack, and you should be able to find it in YouTube uh, or Facebook. But let's take this opportunity now, um, here in this audio-only podcast, to uh, learn something, or perhaps just review something. Maybe you've already watched the video, and you're going to use this audio uh, just to review. So what I'm doing here is 
I'm playing these different inversions of minor 7 chords, but I'm actually not thinking about playing minor 7 chords. I'm thinking about using common basic major chord shapes. So this is a way for me to move around the fretboard and play minor 7 chord inversions without actually having to learn something new. I can make use of something that I already know. Let me explain how this works. We're going to start with an A minor chord here in the open position. And an A minor triad is made up of the notes A, C, and E. A, C, E. And so any combination of those notes on guitar is going to make an A minor chord. Um, to play an A minor 7, you've got to put a flat 7 in there. So instead of just a root minor 3rd and 5th, you'd have a root minor 3rd, 5th, and flat 7. And the flat 7 would be G. So A, C, E, G would make a A minor 7 chord. Time you combine those notes, you make an A minor 7 chord. So A minor 7 is A, C, E, and G. <clears throat> and maybe you already figured this out. Wait a minute. If you take the notes C, E, and G, that's a C major chord. So an A minor 7 chord is actually like a C major chord with an A in the bass. So if I play a C major chord, but put an A in the bass position, it actually sounds like an A minor 7 because they have common chord tones. Um, if you don't have the A in there, if you've got a C in the bass position, then it's just a plain old C major. But if you have an A in the bass position, it becomes A minor 7. Same notes become A minor 7 with that A in the uh, bass position. And this is true no matter where I am on the fretboard. So I can play C major chord shapes all over the fretboard in various ways. And you can see me do this in the video. And you know, if you um, are beyond the basics and you know your way around the fretboard and how to build the, the simplest, simplest of all chords, major chords, you should be familiar with the um, common ways that we play, you know, major chords on the fretboard. <clears throat> so you probably can more easily find uh, different versions of C major to play on the fretboard than you can if I said play different versions of A minor 7 around the, uh, around the fretboard. Especially if I said play inversions of the A minor 7 chord. Uh, that you might get stuck on that and think, oh gosh, I need to think, I need to think through this and work this out and learn some new fingerings and memorize them. Actually, with this hack, you don't. All you need to do is just play portions of C major chords. And as long as you're playing over a piece of music um, <clears throat> that's uh, based on A minor 7 or has an A in the bass, or if you're playing with other instrumentalists and someone is playing that A in the bass position, the bass player or the keyboard player or whatever, when you play different forms of C major on the fretboard, it's not going to sound like C major. It's actually going to sound like A minor 7. Um, so maybe to demonstrate that, um, let's clear out my loop here. And let's start a new loop. I'm just going to play some a C note. OK, so now I have some C in the bass position. And I'm going to just go around the fretboard and play some common C chord fingerings. Kind of just playing some different portions. I might think about the cage system or, you know, common A form or E form bar chords. So it sounds like C, right? I'm playing uh, different combinations of the notes C, E, and G. That makes a C major chord. And with the C in the bass, it sounds like C. Okay, let's switch. Let's play an A now. All right, there's my A in the bass position. If I go through now and play those same chord shapes I just played a moment ago, different com combinations of C, E, and G, it's not going to sound like C. It's going to sound like A minor 7. In that. So that's the hack. The hack is that you don't have to learn a bunch of new chords for, for A minor 7. You can actually just play C major chord shapes. I do this all the time. 
in my head, I realize that A minor and C major are relative major and relative minor. So, you know, if ever I'm jamming on a song and, uh, you know, let's say um, it's something like, uh, you know, uh, well, let's, let's go to the song that I'm going to use as an example, um, Light My F Fire by the Doors. So what if I want to move around the fretboard and play some different versions of A minor 7, I automatically think, just think C major. And so long as there's so, either I'm able to play that A in the bass position, in this case it's easy because I can play the open fifth string A, If I'm able to do that, or as long as there's another instrument that's taking care of that, I don't need to worry about it. So, you know, as a guitarist, when you're playing in a band situation where you've got a bass player or a piano player or somebody else who's clearly establishing the root notes, you don't really need to establish the root notes in your chords, you know? It's, it, you don't always have to play full chord shapes with the roots in there. You can do stuff like... and let the other instruments take care of the bass notes uh, for you. And so that's where this little hack uh, really comes into play. And it's going to work between any chords that have a relative major and a relative minor um, relationship. So, for example, if I just put a capo on my second fret of my guitar here and play an A minor 7 chord shape, well, now that's B minor 7. And it's actually the notes of a D major, D, F sharp, A. If I put a B in the bass position, B, D, F sharp, A, makes a B minor 7. So that means I can move around the fretboard and just think D major chord shapes. And it's always going to sound like a, a B minor 7. So <clears throat> what I did earlier with my loop, which I need to recreate now, it's based on the solo section to light my fire by the doors, and it just goes back and forth between an A minor triad and a B minor triad. Let me get that in the loop. Then I'll play A minor 7 to B minor 7. And I'm just playing on strings uh, 2, 3, and 4. I like the way these voicings sound. As opposed to going... I just want strings two, three, and four. Or maybe I just do one, two, and three. That's not a nice sound. I'm gonna go back to two, three, and four. Strings two, three, and four. So this is A minor seven to B minor seven. Or actually, it looks like it's just part of a C major chord shape to a D major chord shape. So then I can go to the next position and just think, well, where's in the next position? Where do I play a C major to a D major? And that would be like A form bar chords now. I'm just playing strings two, three, and four, barring with one finger here. So I don't even have to think about how to build an A minor seven or B minor seven. I'm just thinking C to D. Then I go to the next position and find C to D. These are E form bar chords now, but instead of doing the whole thing, well, that's, and I don't want the roots in there, but I'm just breaking it down and just playing strings two, three, and four. So C, because of the what's happening in the bass, it actually sounds like A minor seven, B minor seven, and then I can go to the next position, which is the same as where I started from an octave higher, and I get like C and C form and D and C form. So from the beginning, these are real simple shapes. I know them because they're straight out of the common major chord shapes. So my fingers know them well, my eyeballs can spot them easily, and I could keep going here. Um, if I want to change my rhythm up here to um, copy what's happening in Light My Fire, it'd be more like this.
You know, something I don't mention in the video is that this is a modal chord progression here. It's like you're in the G major scale and you're playing off its second degree A minor and its third degree B minor. So two, three, two, three. Um, but uh, I, I teach that in like fretboard theory volume one, but when you get into level two, I explain that, well, usually mus musicians are always gonna number a scale from the tonic. And in this case, the tonic pitch is A. So A would be considered one and B would be considered two. We're still, this is still out of the parent major scale of G major, but we would restructure it and think of it um, as starting on A. And that gives us what's called a Dorian mode. So this is a, a Dorian mode. That's using the G major scale, but you're focusing on its second degree A. And so it just changes the whole the sound of the scale. So. I don't know the solo, but it's got that sort of thing happening in there. So good little Dorian uh, mode jam here. All right, so in the video, you know, I show you how you can play um, some common form, uh, common fingerings for an A minor seven chord. For example, this open A minor seven, and I show you how it's practically a C major chord shape if you just put your ring finger down on the C. And likewise, as you move this A minor seven chord shape up to like B minor seven, well, if you just put your pinky on the fifth string, it becomes D major and C form and so on. And that's how you can figure out what the relative major and minor is so that you can take advantage of these major chord shapes and use them as uh, minor seven. So if I'm playing like C minor seven, I just put my pinky down on the fifth string. Okay, well the relative major is, that's an E flat. So I can use E flat chord shapes uh, and play them, as, uh, use them as C minor seven. I'm gonna keep going like, minor seven, if I put my pinky down, well, that's F major. So F major chord shapes can be D minor seven, and so on. Or you might use the common minor seven chord fingering that's rooted in the sixth string, sixth string, like A minor seven at the fifth fret. It's like a minor, E minor, E form minor bar chord, but you lift your pinky finger. And when you do this, you know, you're barring across the fifth fret, holding strings two, three, and four under your index finger. And those same notes are part of a C chord, an A form, rooted at the third fret of the fifth string. And so that's the way that I figure this out. Like when I play an A minor seven, rooted on the sixth string, my eyeballs immediately realize that, oh, that's related to a C major rooted on the fifth string. So I realized whenever I'm playing A minor seven, I could use some C major chord shapes uh, in, its, in its place. And, and I can, so on, if I move that bar chord up to like B minor seven at the seventh fret, well, I can see that, oh, well, that's got notes in common with a D major rooted on the fifth string at the fifth fret. So that's the way I do it. I don't think circle of fifths in my head or a music staff or anything like that. I just visualize the fretboard and I see how those uh, sh uh, shapes connect. And I use this trick all the time. Light My Fire is an example of this, but um, <clears throat> this works really well when I'm playing like maybe kind of funky sort of guitar stuff with some minor seven chord shapes. Usually in that style, you don't want to be playing full bar chords. You want to stay away from the roots anyway let other instruments handle that, particularly the bass. Um, and it sounds good to like just use some smaller chord, um, chord voicings and inversions. And so it's a perfect place to just think major chord shapes. And you can, I can move around the fretboard uh, real easily and I don't have to rethink things or remap things out. Well, that's all I'm going to say here about my minor seven chord hack. Remember that you can go to uh, YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or uh, tick, even TikTok and just uh, make sure you're following Desi Cerna Guitar and you can search minor seven chord hack and you can find my video. And uh, make sure you like and comment and all of that uh, good stuff. I also have a video called a major seven chord hack where I show you how you can actually take 
basic minor triads and use them as major seven chords. I did that one a while ago, so just search major seven chord hack Desi Serna and you'll find that as well. I'm pretty sure I did a past podcast on that too, but um, you'll want to see the video. All right, we are ready to move on to some questions. So let's hop right into it. First one comes from Michael and he asks, do you recommend using a looper pedal to practice for a new player? And if so, what kind? Um, Good question. Um, Looper pedals are great. I just used a looper pedal to put this bass line down here so I can play over the top of it. And so, yeah, it's a great tool for practicing, um, just for working on composition, just having fun, jamming. Um, I definitely recommend getting a uh, looper. I've got a video on YouTube if you search Desi Serna how to use a looper pedal. I'll show you um, the best way to use it, how to start and stop your loops on time so it's seamless and everything. But Michael's question here specifically is, do you recommend it for a new player? Uh, no, I, w- I wouldn't recommend it for um, a new player because you are you don't yet have the skills to, to utilize it. You got to learn how to play first. <laughs> so, um, you know, I recommend that uh, newcomers learn the basics, learn some basic chords, learn how to strum along with simple songs, learn how to keep in time with the music and um, you know, use strum patterns and learn how to transition from verse to chorus, bridge, and that sort of thing. I've got some free instruction on my website that can help you do that. Just go to guitarmusictheory.com and uh, you'll see the option for um, beginner instruction. So once you get to the point where you can actually play songs, you can play along with them, you can stay in time with the music, then you'd be ready to get a looper pedal and start experimenting um, uh, with that. <clears throat> Probably at that point, too, you might get one of my books like Fretboard Theory or Guitar Theory for Dummies or something like that and start learning some pentatonic patterns and, you know, start learning how you can jam over progressions and stuff, you know. Anyway, that was some minor pentatonic. Um, And so you'll be ready for it at that point. But as a total newcomer, uh, no, you don't need a uh, uh, looper pedal. I, when you do get a pedal, which kind do I recommend? It doesn't matter. Just go to your local music store and try out a couple um, or just buy one from an online retailer. I would say to start out with, just get something simple and inexpensive so you can uh, play around with it, get the basic idea, and see if it's something you enjoy or not. Um, if you really get into it, you might want to spend more money on a fancier unit that's got more options more options would be like more record time for longer loops or maybe separate pedals to start and stop. Um, the simpler units usually just have one foot switch and it's like one, you, you tap once and you start recording, you got to tap twice to stop recording, you got to press and hold to, to delete or something like that. Um, some people like to have um, dedicated foot switches for each function. So they can just do one foot switch when they start, one foot switch when they when they stop. But um, I would just get an inexpensive, simple unit to get started and just see see if you like it. And then you can splurge and uh, try a fancier unit. Or just go to a music store and try out the options. Maybe right out of the gate you really want those extra options. You know, Most people just get a simple unit. They've got some loopers that really get quite complicated so you can do multiple layers and people plug their microphones in and can do some pretty spectacular things in live performances but <laughs> I mean you kind of get way ahead of yourself um, looking into those uh, functions I think you just need to focus on the basics all right next we actually just have some praise it's not a question it comes from Mick and he says hi Desi I would like to thank you for the great resources you have produced. I have played in numerous bands during my life, mostly by ear, and what, I, and what I've been able to pick up from books and other players along the way. It wasn't until I found your books that I was finally able to figure out what I was doing. To say it lit some light bulbs is a gross understatement. I have completed your fretboard theory one and two, as well as your guitar picking mechanics book. Congratulations, they leave everything else I've seen in the shade. Well, thanks, Mick. You know, um, man, I'm passionate about what I do, and I've taught guitar for decades now, and I just love to teach, and, you know, I want people to experience the same joy 
um, playing their guitar that I do. So I've kind of poured my love and my nerdiness into my work. So um, hey, anyone, any of my listeners here who maybe haven't uh, enrolled in a video course or purchased a book or something like that, uh, I think that you will get your money's worth and you'll also be able to support uh, my website and this podcast and we'll keep it going. So thanks for the praise, Mick. And if anyone else wants to um, send me compliments like that, just go to the website and scroll down and click on the contact link. Or you know what? (laughs) While we're on this, better yet, it's great for you to send your feedback to me. I appreciate that. But if you really want to help me and and my business and help me get more exposure, you're going to tell other people about it. So write a review for a book that you purchased on Amazon. Comment on a YouTube video or a Facebook post. Share a YouTube video or a Facebook post. Maybe you're not, you don't have many guitar players that follow your social media profiles, but if you're on Facebook, you know, you can, you can join um, different guitar groups and stuff, groups on music theory or guitar technique or all sorts of things, and you can go into those groups where you've got guitar players who are hanging out, and you can share some of my videos and content and say, hey, I really love this video, really helped me out, Desi's a great teacher, check him out. That's one of the best things that you can do uh, to so- support me, and I always love it when I when I see people do that. I love when people email me directly too, but sometimes I'm a little disappointed because I'm like, gosh, this was so well said. I wish other people could see it. So consider um, posting your praise somewhere where other people can see it. We are moving on. And oh boy, this is an interesting question. Um, This comes from Riley and he says, I have a question regarding practicing with minor learning disabilities. I have ADHD and was wondering if, in your teaching experience, you have seen others use different practice techniques that help them to improve. How do you memorize and retain songs? Um, That's a good question. So, uh, Riley uh, and everybody else listening, it might surprise you to know that I also have um, some form of ADHD. Uh, You know, that's kind of a catch-all term that is used to categorize people who kind of struggle with certain types of uh, issues that, you know, fall into a a range of things. I'm like really high with some ADH symptoms and then I'm really, really low with with others. Um, But it's something that I've had my whole life and it's, uh, um, it it has been a struggle. I'm kind of fortunate because um, while I do definitely have some symptoms of ADHD, I also have a personality type that is really good at managing that. So my life has basically been uh, Desi looking over Desi's shoulder and redirecting uh, uh, myself. I'm very organized, um, uh, which is something that's usually uh, uncharacteristic for uh, someone who has ADHD. Um, I don't have any trouble keeping track of time and that sort of thing. Um, Anyway, uh, so I do know that struggle, though. One of, my, one of the things that I struggle badly with is kind of my short-term memory and my memory recall can be really bad. Um, like I can't go to the grocery store to get three items unless I write them down. I mean, if I need to get like, you know, milk, eggs, and bread, I'll be like, oh, no problem. I'll get to the grocery store and I'll be like, what did I need to get again? Um, uh, my long-term memory is amazing. I can look back at photographs of myself and I can, rec- when I was very young, and I can remember what was happening in the room. I can tell you about things that's not, that's out of, outside of the frame or who was on the phone when I was talking on the phone. And these are pictures where I was two years old or less. I'm not exaggerating. So I have a really crazy long-term memory. My short-term memory sucks. <laughs> it's like, um, anyway, uh, so... And I feel your pain if you're if you're struggling with that. It is a struggle for me as well. And so he's asking, like, well, how do you, you how do you remember songs? Well, for me, like, I play music much better when I don't need to use my short term working memory to like read charts while I'm playing or anything like that. Um, reading music is really difficult for me. I just my brain can't track. Even though I've learned learned how to read music when I was a teenager, and I've been. I've had that skill for decades. I just never could get good at it. I could never be a, an orchestra player or something like that. There just isn't any amount of practice that can get over the way my brain struggles with that sort of thing. But once, but if I just 
practice something by rote, and once I get it committed to my long-term memory and my muscle memory and so on, then it's a totally different, totally different ball game. Um, and this is actually true for most people, whether you would have ADHD or not. Um, you know, I need to kind of get out of my frontal lobe in order to play my best. And so I'm thinking maybe, Riley, you know, that's what you need to do as well. So this is where you need to kind of follow my advice where, you know, you just look away from the charts and just, you know, run things down until you not only have them memorized like in your mind, but you actually kind of get out of your mind and you develop that muscle memory. So you want to lock them into that muscle memory. And this also might mean, Riley, that, you know, don't try to spread yourself too thin, you know. Um, you might want to just narrow your focus a little bit and work on getting really good at playing uh, fewer things. You might need to do that. Um, so that's what I suggest. Uh, you know, you got to explore your options and, f you know, learn how to play to your strengths. That's what getting good involves some ingenuity and it involves some discovering your strengths. You know, I discovered that I could never be an orchestra player because um, I can't sight read like that. But I'm really good at other things, so um, I focused on those. Um, I know some people who are great piano players, but they couldn't, could not, they can't improvise, they're not comfortable with playing unless there's sheet music in front of them because that's the way their brain works best. And so, you know, there's different ways that you can approach music and you can excel at an instrument in different ways. So, Riley, don't give up. Keep running those songs. Work on muscle memory. I think that's going to be your friend. It certainly has been my friend. If I'm trying to re recall a song that I used to play, um, sometimes I just have to pick up my guitar and just kind of go through the motions and because I'm trying to reactivate that muscle memory. You know, like my conscious memory can't remember the song, but I know if I just go through the motions, my fingers are going to go to where they need to be, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's, that's how it's played. So... Riley, maybe you'll have that same experience. And you know what? Before I move on, I should probably say this since we're on the topic of ADHD and I admitted to having some of those symptoms. I have tried every medication, stimulant, non-stimulant, supplement, everything on the planet that's available. None of it helps me. I didn't like any of it. Absolutely no positive benefit, just side effects. So if you're thinking that you want to email me and encourage me by telling me that I need to do this or do that or try this or try that, trust me, I have. So I've just learned to like just accept, you know, um, some of the little struggles that I have and I deal with them, you know. All right, let's move on. Tom says, Desi, I feel like when I started, everything was hard, everything was a struggle. Now I divert back to what's comfortable and have a hard time struggling without giving up or getting frustrated. Um, Tom goes on to ask if this is a bad habit and hurting his progress. He also asked if maybe practicing exercises was the solution to continuing the improvement of his technique. Well, Tom, here's my answer. You actually sound a lot like me. Um, as I get older and more experienced and wiser, I find myself gravitating towards playing things that I'm most comfortable with. So whereas in the past, I always felt like I needed to push myself, I don't, I don't feel that way anymore. And what's interesting is that there are many things I'm completely comfortable with playing that other people might struggle with, even though they're kind of an equally skilled player, like uh, overall. You know, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. I just mentioned that in the previous question. And the key to being a good player is to discover your strengths and run with them. Um, this is why... Slash doesn't try to finger tap like Eddie Van Halen or the edge from U2 doesn't try to sound like Steve Ray Vaughan. So I don't, you know, I don't think that like, obviously in order to make progress, particularly in the early stages, yeah, you got to push yourself, you know, no pain, no gain. You're learning, you're learning something new. But at some point, I think it's okay to kind of just park out at a level and say, I'm satisfied with my skills. I want to focus on just all the different things I can do with this skill set without necessarily trying to, you know, push myself to get to some other level. Because sometimes, sometimes getting to another level um, is not necessarily better, you know? Do we think that Mike Campbell from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers needed to push himself to get to another level? Did he need to learn how to, uh, you know, shred like Steve I or, you know, learn how to play, you know, finger style as 
as, as skillfully as Chet Atkins? No, he didn't. He needed to just be Mike Campbell, and he's got that amazing body of work, you know, with the Heartbreakers and these wonderful little hooks and tones and everything. And it's like, man, he just kind of found his level and, and his what he was good at, and he just used it you know, as much as he could in all the wonderful ways that, that he could. So I'm not trying to discourage people from trying new things or pursuing new techniques or practicing. I'm just saying you kind of have to, you know, uh, make that choice about whether it's necessary, are you enjoying the process, um, or, you know, maybe do you need to kind of back off yourself a little bit. So I know for me personally, like over the years, I've just felt like, you know, I'm like pushing myself when I don't need to push myself anymore. Like it's like, I don't have to, I don't have to improve in, in, in certain areas. I don't, or I don't have to keep improving, you know, it's up to each person to make that determination of when they think that they're, they're kind of comfortable. As for exercises, I usually like to make parts from songs exercises. Um, so I don't usually tell people like, oh, yeah, try this finger exercise or this picking exercise or, you know, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast. I'm just not a fan of that stuff. So, you know, for example, when I learned the song Blackbird by the Beatles um, and I put a video on YouTube uh, for that, you can go check that out. Um, I realized that I had been kind of using a traditional finger picking pattern on that. But Paul McCartney actually uses a combination of finger plucking and like this finger strumming technique. And that was new to me. And so when I learned that song, I thought, well, I want to play this song, and I like the feel and the style of, of his uh, um, uh, finger picking here. So I ended up just making that song was kind of my exercise. I broke down the parts of that song and learned them and practiced them. And in doing so, I not only learned a great song, uh, Blackbird, posted a video on YouTube and Facebook, um, but then I got used to playing with a different feel and a different technique. And I got there through a song instead of... Uh, just some sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, generic exercise. Um, you know, exercises have their place. It kind of depends what your goals are. Um, some people, if they're really serious about shred guitar and playing really fast and sweep arpeggios, they're, they're working on exercises that specifically work to develop that technique. Me personally, I'll do that so long as it's something practical that I can learn in a song. So I'll take some, some fast lines out of a solo to a song or something or a riff or whatever, and I'll use that as my exercise. But I just have never been one to do exercises for the sake of exercises because I want to have, be able to play something fast for the sake of playing something fast. That's just my you know, personal opinion. Now, I did create the, the book, Guitar Picking Mechanics. I got a video course uh, for that as well. Um, and so there are extra picking exercises in there. But I actually based all my picking exercises, many of them, on actual song parts. So I'd say, let's take a look at how, you know, Clapton, you know, plays. Um, let's get out of looper mode here. Let's take a look at how Clapton plays, you know, Crossroads or something like that, you know. <laughs> How can we pick that so that we don't miss notes, you know, and, and what, what are our options? Um, you know, stuff like that, or even just doing something like, uh, you know, something like... How are you going to pick that? Are you going to go down, 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 up, down, 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 up? You might think, well, yeah, Desi, duh. That's, how else would you do it? Well, Buck Dharma from Blue Oyster Cult, who I met and who actually taught me how to play this song, doesn't do it that way. He alternate picks it. He goes down, down, excuse me, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. up. He says that having the consistent down-up motion made it easier for him to stay in time while he was also singing. He wrote and he, you know, and he sings that song as well. So um, in Guitar Picking Mechanics, I give you plenty of exercises to practice your scales, but I also make them musical and I base them on things that you're going to encounter in actual 
song. So it's a little diff, a little bit different than most methods that you might find on that sort of technique because I wanted it to, to be more practical and I think I nailed it. So um, go check out Guitar Picking Mechanics. And we are moving on. Uh, the next question is, how can I overcome stage fright? And I get this question from time to time. People are like, Desi, you know, my skills have come together. I got, got these songs down. But gosh, when I go to play in front of other people, I get so nervous and everything falls apart. So um, coincidentally, some time ago, I was contacted by an author named Elisa DiNapoli. And she was just trying to promote her book. Um, and I did not read her book, but I'm looking at it here on Amazon. And it's called Dare to be Seen. From Stage Fright to Stage Presence, Command the Stage and Magnify Your Presence in 10 Easy Steps. Um, so you could go to Amazon. I'm going to put a link in the podcast show notes um, to this book. I haven't read it, so I can't really give you a full endorsement, but it sounds interesting. She was very nice. We exchanged a couple of uh, emails, and I told her I would kind of give her a plug and yeah maybe some some of my listeners could check this book book out and uh, send me some feedback and let me know um, let me know if you like it you know so I'm just looking at the description here and it says do you shrink under the spotlight discover a powerful method to banish nerves and help you stand out from the crowd does public speaking terrify you <laughs> so this might be more about just Musical performances it might be about you know business presentations and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I typically have never had issues in that situation. Um, not that I haven't had nerves or been a little bit nervous, but yeah, I mean, golly, I played a couple thousand gigs in my days. So you get over those nerves when it becomes kind of routine, you know, <laughs> especially when it gets. So routine, it becomes mundane. And you're like, oh, another gig, huh? Who's getting married tonight? All right, here we go. Play that funky music. One, two. You know, I mean, it's like you get over those, you get over those nerves. But anyway, there might be some good stuff here in this book. Maybe I would benefit from uh, reading it. But I'll put a link in the podcast show notes for those of you suffering from stage fright. Check out Dare to be Seen by Elisa DiNapoli. And maybe if we get enough people to uh, read her book and send me comments about it with some questions, maybe I could have her on the podcast as a guest. We'll see. All right, podcast episode 137 is a wrap. If you have questions you would like me to answer in future podcast episodes, just go to my website, guitarmusictheory.com, and scroll down to find the contact link. And while you're there, if you have not yet enrolled in a free video course, answer the question I ask you about your playing, and I'll send you free custom video instruction that's calibrated to your current level. Whether you're a beginner, or you're an advanced player that wants to delve deeply into music theory, or you're somewhere in between, I have some free instruction that's going to help you fill some gaps in your knowledge, fill gaps in your playing, become a better player so you can move forward and reach your music goals. So enroll in that free video course now at guitarmusictheory.com. You can click on the link in the podcast show notes. Well, thanks for listening, Guitar Engineers. I'm Desi Serna. Before you go, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, give it a five-star rating, and leave a review if you can. Then keep playing and stay tuned for more.